Howdy folks, my name is General Solfax and you're watching the first episode of my brand new Tank Academy. In this first episode we're going to be covering all the basic things you need to know to play War Thunder Ground Forces. I'm gonna start by telling you what tanks are, how do they work, how to drive, how to shoot, what kind of crew and what kind of vehicle compartments that you have in your tank, what kind of game modes they are, what's the differences between each type of tanks, and last but not least I will be explaining what kind of tanks we have in game and what you can expect from each line and each nation. War Thunder was originally a World War II air combat simulator made by Gaijin Entertainment and sometime down the line Gaijin decided to add ground vehicles into the game and called it ground forces and that's what we're going to be discussing today. Currently we have three different nations with a fourth one coming in very soon that we can use in War Thunder. First being the USA, second Germany and third Russia with Britain on the way very soon. So when you first log into your War Thunder account, you're going to be greeted by this screen and this is the garage screen. If you played any game that is similar to this, I'm mainly talking about World of Tanks and Armored Warfare, you will be familiar with this layout. On the top of the screen you have your menu button from where you can choose your different options, you have your profile button which shows you what you've done in the game so far, you have your what I call like the call social corner from which you can add your friends and respond to different messages, you have your different kind of currency starting from free experience, to Silver Alliance, which is the normal type of currency which you use to buy modules and vehicles in this game, have your Golden Eagles, which is the premium type of currency that you use to either buy Silver Alliance or to convert free experience to normal experience and of course buy different kind of premium vehicles. Moving on, on the left side of the screen we have the vehicle stat card, which shows you everything you need to know about the vehicle, from how much it weighs, what's its engine power, how fast can it go, how much inclination can it bear, what's its third rotation speed, how much it can depress and elevate its gun, what its armor, what kind of gun it uses, how fast it reloads, and stuff like that. On the bottom side of this little list here you can choose from two different modes, first one being the armor mode which shows you what kind of different armor zone the tank that you have selected has and how effective is the sloping of that armor, secondly is the x-ray mode which shows you what kind of different modules you have in your tank, what's their position and where are your crew members and what they're doing. So the first tank you're going to be receiving are called reserve tanks, each nation gets two and they're basically pre-war and very early World War II tanks and while they're not very good, they're gonna be enough to actually get you playing this game and get you used to tank warfare. Now since War Thunder is a free to play game, there is a certain element of progression. Every single subsequent vehicle after the reserve tanks that you want to play needs to be unlocked and every single vehicle including the reserve tanks have certain modifications that need to be put on it to actually use the vehicle to its fullest potential. So if we click on the modification screen right here, you can see all of those modifications. They separate into three different groups. First one being the mobility, second one being protection, and third one being firepower. Now I'm not gonna go into what, what each one of these modifications does exactly, but just so you know, mobility increases your vehicle's mobility, protection gives you access to on-field repairs, and give you access to fire prevention equipment, which is of course going to put out fires in your tank. Uh, the third one basically gives you access to different kinds of shell. Now this is very important to actually research them in a certain order and because parts is a very important part, the first thing you want to do when you unlock a new vehicle, you want to immediately start researching parts. When you research the first tier of this modification, the second tier is going to become unlocked and you're going to research them and the first thing you want to research in the second tier is of course fire prevention equipment. The way you actually research these modules is by playing the game and earning research points which is basically how this game calls experience. The same thing goes for unlocking other tanks, you choose one tank to research and all the experience you gain playing goes into researching that single tank. Unfortunately you can't just choose any tank to unlock, you first need to unlock all the tanks that come before it in that tank line. Tanks are separated into five different tiers. To advance from tier 1 to tier 2, you need to research a certain amount of tanks to unlock the ability to unlock tier 2 tanks. Same goes for tier 3, tier 4 and tier 5. One last thing before we move on to more important stuff. All vehicles in the game have a certain battle rating that depends on a few factors, but to put it bluntly, it depends on how good the vehicle is. Battle ratings are used to match up tanks against other tanks of equal strength and provide us a balanced game. Battle ratings range from 1.0 to 7.7 .7 at maximum and you can only meet tanks that are plus or minus 1 battle rating. That means that this Panzer IV that stands at 4.3 battle rating can ever only meet 3.3 to 5.3 battle rating tanks. I don't want to spend too much time talking about this and that's basically all you need to know right now because we have a lot more important things to talk about so let's get right to it. 
Now that we've gotten the introductions out of the way, I want to talk a little bit about the tank and what the tank actually is and how it came to be. A tank is a large, heavily armored fighting vehicle with tracks and a large tank gun that is designed for frontline combat. Inventors and engineers have been flirting with the idea of creating a large, heavily armored type of vehicle for centuries before the birth of the first proper tank. One of the most famous examples would be the wooden made man powered vehicle with cannons all around its base that was drawn by the famous Leonardo da Vinci in the late 15th centuries. Leonardo never attempted to create this vehicle so for the first real tank we had to wait another 5 centuries at the beginning of World War I. The first tanks were designed as a way to break the stalemates that were caused by trench warfare during World War I where neither side would advance and risk massive casualties by charging the enemy's fortified position. No one person can be credited with the invention of the tank, however, leading roles were played by Major Walter Gordon Wilson, who designed the gearbox and developed the practical tracks, and by William Tritton, whose agriculture machinery company, w William Forrester and Company, built the prototypes. In early 1915, William Forrester and Company started working on a few prototypes of tracked armor vehicles that ultimately did fail, but they did pave the way for the creation of the first functional tank, the Little Willie. Little Willie was 8 meters long, 3 meters wide and 2.5 meters tall. He weighed 16.5 ton and was powered by a Foster Dylmer Night Sleeve Valve Petrol engine that outputted 105 horsepower, which gave it a nake breaking speed of 3.2 kilometers per hour or 2 miles per hour. Although Willie was never a very practical tank or was it used in combat, it was a great step forward in military technology and served as a proof of concept that was needed to persuade Britain military leaders to invest time and resources towards developing further tanks. Following the Little Willie came the first mass-produced tank and the first tank that saw combat, the Mark I. The Mark I came in two versions, the first one being the male version that was equipped with the QF6 Pounder Hodgkin's 57mm gun and the female version that was equipped with multiple machine guns for anti-infantry purposes. Soon after that the French Renault company, famous in the present day for producing personal automobiles, designed and produced the first turreted tank, the Renault FT, or as its preferred post-war, the FT-17. The general design of the FT-17 with its engine at the back, crew compartments at the front and the main armament in the turret proved to be the best layout for designing tanks. The same general design philosophy is being used in designing today's state-of-the-art main battle tanks. That was in short the origin story of tanks, but we don't have all day so let's get down to what kind of different types of tanks we have in War Thunder and what makes them special. Since all armor fighting vehicles that we have in War Thunder have a similar design philosophy, they all share certain features. All the vehicles we have in War Thunder are tracked vehicles, which means that they operate on some sort of track. They're mostly similar, so I'm not going to get any differences between them. Another thing that's worth noting that every single vehicle in War Thunder has some sort of forward-facing arm. In the case of the Panzerkampfwagen 4F2, the tank that I'm showing you right here, it is the 75mm long barrel cannon. But yeah, that's all very simple and obvious, but now we come to the important stuff. Every single fighting vehicle in War Thunder shares a certain amount of modules and crew members and now if we take the x-ray viewer right here on the left side of the screen you can see them. Now in no particular order these modules, these modules are the cannon barrel and the cannon breech which make the cannon itself that is used to shoot the shells. The vertical, the vertical, there it is, the vertical aiming drive that is used to elevate and depress the gun, the horizontal aiming drive that is used to rotate the turret in a 360 degree manner, the transmission that is used to change the speeds, the engine that is used to power the tank of course, the fuel tank that stores the fuel that is used in the engine, the radiators that are used to cool the engine so it doesn't overheat, and last but not least, well, actually the least because they're not used for anything, an assortment of different optics and radio stations which have actually no use in the game just yet. I intentionally failed to mention the ammo placement because ammo placement differs from tank to tank and while it's very important we got some more important things to talk about so I mentioned that each fighting vehicle in War Thunder shares a certain amount of crew members. It differs from tank to tank, some have 4, some have 5, some have even 6 crew members but the Panzerkampfwagen 4 of F2 has only 5 crew members so let's start from the bottom. So. The driver is of course in charge of driving the tank as he sits at the front. Next to the driver is the machine gunner who is in charge of firing this lone machine gun here. In the turret we have the loader who is of course in charge of loading the cannon breech with shells. We have the aimer or the gunner who is in charge of traversing the turret, aiming the gun and firing the gun. And last but not least we have the commander who is in charge of coordinating all of these guys and is basically the most important person in the tank. 
While all tanks in War Thunder share similar modules, crew members and crew placements, they don't all have the same arrangement. As you can see here, this Russian T-34 has its transmission in the back and only has four crew members. It's important to know that every single module your tank has can be damaged or knocked out and that every crew member can be wounded or in the worst case scenario killed. Modules and crew members can be knocked out in various ways, but the most common way is by a shell that successfully penetrates your tank and detonates inside, exploding and sending shrapnel all around, but we will talk about that just a little bit later. When a module or crew member gets knocked out, you won't be able to use that module until it's repaired and in the case of a downed crew member, his position will be vacant until he is replaced. For example, if your engine gets knocked out, you can't drive the tank forward anymore, or if your horizontal turret drive gets jammed, you won't be able to rotate your turret. It's a similar story regarding crew members if, let's say, your driver is unconscious, you can move the tank until one of the other crew members replaces him at that position. The same thing goes for the loader and the gunner. If either of them are knocked out, you won't be able to rotate your turret or fire the cannon. Now, here comes the very important bit. While destroyed modules can be repaired, providing you have unlocked the required modification, after a crew member is knocked unconscious, he is permanently indisposed, meaning once you lose a crew member, he's lost for the remainder of that match. Now, that does not mean that once your driver is knocked out, you won't be able to move your tank anymore. Less vital crew members like the machine gunner or a radio operator will abandon their posts and assume the more important position that is now vacant. To put it plainly, only two crew members are required to operate most tanks, a gunner and a driver, so as long as you have two crew members alive, you'll still be able to use your tank. Naturally, two people can't operate a tank as efficiently as a whole crew, so when you start losing crew members, the reload time of your guns will decrease, the turret will turn slower, and so on and so on. So, now that you know what tanks are and how they work, it's time to tell you about the different types of armor fighting vehicles we have in War Thunder. We have five different types of armor fighting vehicles in War Thunder, starting with light tanks like the M22 Locust, medium tanks su such as the Panzer IVs and Panzer Trees, heavy tanks such as the KV-2, the Tiger-1 and the IS-1, tank destroyers like the Stug 3 g the Su-85 and things like that, and last but not least, we have the self-propelled anti-aircraft guns, like this thing. So starting with the light tanks, light tanks are very lightly armored, very fast, small machines that are basically used for reconnaissance, for scouting out area for other fighting vehicles to approach and try to take out the enemy. Medium tanks such as the Panzers and the T-34s form the backbones of their respective nations, ground forces. Most medium tanks have average mobility and speed, but better armor than light tanks, their cannons are medium caliber multi-purpose infantry support and anti-tank guns. Heavy tanks are designed to break through the front lines and assault enemy fortified positions. They are very slow when compared to medium and light tanks, but their armor is much, much better and they carry high caliber guns that are able to knock out enemy tanks with ease. While other types of tanks are mainly intended as infantry support with a secondary anti-tank role, tank destroyers are specifically designed for taking out other tanks, thus the name tank destroyers. Most tank destroyers are turretless and are made from chassis of existing vehicles with medium to high caliber velocity guns. Their armor is thickest at the fronts with the sides and the rears having significantly less armor. The last type of vehicle we have are self-propelled anti-aircraft guns. The name speaks of their usage, they are usually lightly armored with rapid firing small caliber guns and are not designed to fight tanks. Now that you know all of that, we can finally move on to the gameplay itself. Driving your tank is pretty simple. You drive the tank by either using the W, A, S and D keys or using the arrow keys. You control the turret with your mouse and finally you fire the cannon using the left mouse button. To look around without moving your turret, you can hold the C button by default and use your mouse to rotate the camera. To keep your tank moving while you're looking around, you can tap the E key, tapping it once locks it to a low gear so you can attempt to shoot on the move, tapping it multiple times locks it to a higher gear so you can achieve faster speeds. Pressing the right mouse button at any time will zoom in on whatever you're looking at with the cannon and pressing the V by default will switch your view to the sniper mode, allowing you to make more precise shots. Sounds simple, right? Well, yes and no. Just saying point your cannon and shoot it isn't gonna cut it past tier 1. There are only two ways a tank can be destroyed or rendered useless in War Thunder. The first one I mentioned earlier, uh, and that is by knocking out enough crew members, thus preventing the enemy of using the tank, and the second is by detonating the ammo stored in the tank by either shooting it directly or setting the tank on fire. 
but to destroy a tank you first need to be able to penetrate it. Every tank in the game has a certain amount of armor and every type of ammo a cannon fires has a certain amount of armor it can penetrate. If your ammo has more penetration than the enemy has armor, you will be able to penetrate his tank. While we're on the subject of ammo, I need to point that there are three basic types of ammo in ground forces. The most standard ammo most tanks carry as their default ammo is armor piercing cap ballistic or armor piercing high explosive shells. It's basically a normal tank shell that has some amount of high explosive filler in it, can be blunt nosed or point nosed, and when it penetrates it explodes inside the tanks and sends shrapnel all around. It's the shell you want to use against most targets because these kinds of shells have a very good ratio of armor penetration and post penetration damage. The second type of shell that's shared across all tanks is some form of high explosive shell. This shell has a very limited amount of armor penetration, most time not exceeding 50mm of armor for low and medium caliber guns and is best used against lightly armored targets like AA trucks and some light tanks. Unlike armor piercing high explosive shells, high explosive shells explode on contact and it's the shrapnel they produce that penetrates and damages the tanks so you can't fire through destroyable opticals like fences. Naturally, the bigger the caliber of the shell, the more high explosive filler it has and thus can penetrate more am armor and do more damage. This basically goes for, well, all shells we have in War Thunder. The bigger the caliber of the shell, expect it to do more damage to enemy tanks. The last shell I'm going to be talking about is usually found on early to late war tanks and it is the armor piercing composite rigid shell. This shell is specifically designed to pierce highly armored targets, it has higher shell velocity than standard APHE shells, or has no high explosive filler and does not fragment after penetration as much so it does less damage. It's recommended to use this shell only if you know that you can't penetrate the tank you're shooting. The best advice I can give you regarding successfully penetrating enemy tanks is knowing how much penetrating power your shell has and knowing the armor layout of enemy tanks. You can preview all tanks and check out their armor layout regardless of if you have researched them or not. So now that you know all of this, I think it's time to discuss the different game modes we have in War Thunder. There are three different game types in War Thunder. Arcade battles, realistic battles, and finally simulator battles. So starting with arcade mode, arcade mode is the most newbie friendly game mode for a number of reasons. Enemy markers detailing vehicle type, model and distance are displayed above friendly and more importantly enemy vehicles and as long as one of the players on your team has made visual contact with an enemy tank, that tank will be displayed on the map and on the minimap and if you're close enough to the enemy tank it will be displayed directly on your screen. Tanks in arcade mode also get an engine boost, meaning that they will accelerate faster, turn tighter and reach their top speed easier, along with an increased turret rotation speed. Arcade mode is the only game mode that provides the player with some sort of aiming and shooting assistance. The white plus sign in the middle of my crosshair that you see on the screen indicates where your shell will hit, and aiming at an enemy tank it will change color from red to yellow to green. Red indicates that you cannot penetrate the enemy tank by shooting them there with that type of shell. Yellow means that you have a roughly 50% chance of penetrating them. And the green means that you will most likely penetrate the enemy tank if you shoot it there. Another feature only arcade battle has is a red outline around tank that you're aiming at. Meaning that you don't have to make exact visual contact and fire through various obstacles like bushes, trees and fences and stuff like that. To compensate for making it easy to spot, shoot and penetrate enemy tanks, arcade mode damage modules are kind of tweaked, meaning that it generally takes a few more shots to destroy an enemy tank than it would take in realistic and simulator battles. Lastly, you can spawn in a maximum of 3 different tanks per match, regardless of how well you did. The second game mode we're gonna talk about is realistic mode. Realistic mode is in my honest opinion just an arcade mode without all the aiming and spotting and engine boost and all that kind of stuff, I mean it's not a bad game mode, it's just not exactly towards my taste. While there are still friendly markers on the screen on the minimap, Realistic Battle does away with all enemy markers on the screen. There are however still some enemy markers on the minimap. When an enemy tank shoots its cannon, a small dot appears on the minimap and the map indicating the position of that tank. Furthermore, when an enemy tank gets shot, if you're close to the area, a big ass red arrow will appear on the screen above the enemy tank that just got shot. That's kind of a stupid idea, but let's just roll with it. Also, any form of aiming and shooting assistance is gone in realistic mode, so no more red outlines, no shell landing indicator and no penetration indicator. You will have to know what type of tank you're shooting at and if you can't penetrate his armor. 
Another thing that is not present in realistic battles is any sort of engine boost, meaning that tank will move like they should, turrets will traverse at normal speeds and stuff like that. Lastly, in realistic battle each tank you spawn in costs a certain amount of spawn points, light tanks and uh, self-propelled anti-aircraft guns being the cheapest and heavy tanks being the most priced. At the beginning of every match you get just enough spawn points to spawn the most expensive tank you own, and every subsequent tank after that gets progressively more and more expensive. You accumulate these points by shooting at enemy tanks, destroying enemy tanks, capping points, getting shot yourself, getting assists and so on and so on. You get these points by basically playing the game. One thing that I failed to mention but you might have noticed already, it's the binoculars view. By pressing B by default you will switch to the binoculars view which has much better zoom than the sniper view and you can move it independently of the turret which means that it's very good for looking around when you're going somewhere. And holding the fire button while in binocular view snaps your cannon to where you're looking at so you can always be ready if a tank pops out. The last mode we'll talk about is simulator mode. Simulator mode, or sim for short, is the closest thing this game gets to being an actual World War II tank simulator and for exactly that reason I can't recommend it to newer player despite being my favorite game mode. There's absolutely no hand holding or any type of help for new players in simulator battles. All the markers and indicators both on the screen and on the map are gone, including friendly markers, which means that to play simulator battles you need to be able to distinguish between a friendly and an enemy tank in an instant, or else you stand a good chance of being killed or killing a friendly tank. In addition to this, your camera is forced to the most zoom in position, and well basically you're looking through the eyes of the tank commander, which seriously limits your field of view and gives you, a, well, it gives me a mild sense of claustrophobia and constant panic. Another thing that prevents new players from playing sim battles is that currently sim battles have a predetermined list of tanks that you can take to battle. This list changes each day according to a schedule and is basically an ongoing event that changes each day. Simulator mode uses a unique spawning system. The first armor fighting vehicle you spawn in will be the only vehicle you can use and depending on the type you can get between one or two respawns. Basically light and medium tanks self propel anti-aircraft gun and most tank destroyers get two lives meaning when your first tank gets destroyed you can spawn in an additional one. And heavy tanks and heavy tank destroyers only get one spawn so you really need to think about what tank you want to take into battle. Now that I've finished explaining all the different game modes I think I covered everything you need to know to play your first few games of ground forces. There might of course be some things that I missed but I think that this video is a good intro into ground forces and there's of course a lot more to talk about, I mean this is only the first episode of this series so stay tuned to my channel for more videos such as this one. Lastly, if you're an existing player, I hope you at least enjoyed this video and might just learn something. Anyway, my name has been Rear Admiral Solfax, so goodbye and I will see you next time.